I just request participants to take down as many notes as possible, as possible, and would encourage you to ask uh, as many questions towards the end. Uh, the idea is to kind of, uh, you know, make the most of this web webinar. So yeah, uh, let's start. So logistics. So everyone understands what the logistics facilities are and logistics. Through this diagram, what I wanted to explain you is the entire ecosystem of logistics. So logistics systems are broadly classified based on their proximity to the end customer. So they can be intermodal uh, distribution or fulfillment center as depicted by these uh, this diagram. Intermodal uh, centers are typically more than 3,050 square feet. The consumer product reaches its first destination in the supply chain to which it reaches the points of delivery, be it distribution, fulfillment centers, or doorsteps. Typical uh, markets or the locations of these uh, intermodal centers are logistics hubs, ports, airports, or train stations. Then we move on to the regional centers, which is more distribution centers. And these logistics uh, centers are typically about 350,000 square feet to about a million. A consumer product is received from its point of, uh, point of origin in the supply chain and is reposted or prepackaged over here. Products have at least two more points of delivery, such as UPS, FedEx, or two steps of e-commerce delivery or delivery to brick and mortar. Uh, and finally at customers doorsteps. These are located close to large population centers or in regional distribution uh, centers such as uh, interstates uh, corridors. Lastly are the fulfillment centers, which I think most of us uh, should be aware of. The consumer uh, product reaches a large stage in the logistics supply chain and is delivered from the fulfillment center direct to consumer and it is used to service both uh, B2C and B2B customers. So these are typically located in large population centers and uh, urban locations. Now, uh, the reason I said this is uh, one of my favorite asset classes is because the demand for logistics have been growing pretty steadily uh, or at a very good rate in the past few years. And it's generating a lot of in investor interest, which we'll see in the uh, next slide. But the idea uh, of this slide is to explain you the four key demand drivers, which is uh, leading to more and more demand for logistics centers. So first is e-commerce. Uh, you know, COVID was something unprecedented and uh, it led to a behavioral change uh, for people all across the globe. Uh, the relevance of brick and mortar become uh, less and uh, people used to become, people became used to ordering things online. Uh, with the rise in e-commerce, automatically you need more fulfillment centers so that you can do doorstep delivery. As the chart shows over here, the e-commerce demand in the next five years is expected to grow at about 8%, and which is quite impressive, uh, especially in the European markets, uh, where the GDP typically grows around uh, 3 to 4%. Second is uh, reverse logistics. So I'm pretty sure uh, that people who are attending these uh, webinars also, they must be used to ordering certain things from e-commerce websites such as Amazon. And then if you don't like it, you have always the option to return it back to the uh, either the supplier or the manufacturer. And the movement of goods back from customer to seller is, or, or to manufacturer is called reverse logistics. And that has been on the rise rapidly. One of the staggering figure, uh, staggering statistics that I wanted to share with you, in the e-commerce sector, the return rate is about 30%. So basically what we are saying in people end up returning almost one in three things they order and that propels demand for logistics as well because you need to have the right supply chain infrastructure to be able to facilitate such movement of goods. Third is supply chain reconfiguration. So we, there's an emerging trend where businesses are moving from just in time to just in case approach. And I'll explain you what that means. Uh, and this was partly driven by COVID, another behavioral change. So earlier, you know, in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, just-in-time approach of uh, supply chain was considered to be most co more cost efficient and, uh, uh, you know, deemed to optimize profits. But just-in-case approach really evolved or emerged after COVID. After COVID, there were so many supply chain disruptions across the globe that people realized they were running out of inventory because, you know, uh, there were lockdowns, the, there were restrictions on movement of goods, labor, etc. 
and supply chain is still not back at its full capacity. What, as a result, what businesses have started doing is uh, they have started stocking inventory for about certain weeks or certain months to make sure they don't lose out on business because the cost of lost business uh, is significantly more than the uh, benefit of uh, just in time. And they realize that if they're able to fulfill customer orders, they make more profit than trying to optimize for a just in time delivery. And the last factor is uh, nearshoring where people have realized they, they can't just have a manufacturing uh, look, uh, facility or distribution facility located in one part of the world. Let's take example of, you know, uh, a Tesla. Tesla today manufactures in the US, manufactures in China. And, and the reason for doing that is because, uh, you know, there's so many geopolitical uncertainty, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war or, uh, you know, sanctions against China. And as, as a result, businesses are setting up their manufacturing centers and distribution centers uh, in different parts of the world, which is, again, automatically driving demand for uh, logistics assets. Now, coming to some market trends. So in the previous slide, I explained you what is logistics and what's uh, leading to an increase in demand for the logistics assets. I wanted to show it with some trends. So um, high interest rates uh, in the last 15 years, along with inf inflationary pressures, uh, you know, have seen, uh, have seen the, the demand for logistics assets partly muted, but as the impact of uh, monetary policy starts to filter through the wider economy, we expect logistics will come back strongly. The chart on the left shows the vacancy level. And it, as you can see, around 2011, 2012, these vacancy levels used to be in teens, low teens. Gradually, as e-commerce became more and more pop popular, and you know, I, I, I like to benchmark it against Amazon. As Amazon grew in uh, prominence, you can see the vacancy level in the logistics center uh, centers or logistics assets came uh, kept coming down and they were probably the lowest during COVID, which is reflected in 2020, 2021. Due to inflationary pressures, because people have reduced their discretionary spending as a result, online spending has slightly uh, reduced compared to what it was in the COVID time. The vacancy has slowly uh, gone up, still not at around teens, but in around six to seven percent, but we expect it to come down again as you know, uh, Fed is reducing interest rates and we are seeing similar response by Bank of England as well. Now, rental growth is very closely linked to the vacancy level. As we can see on the chart on, on the right, whenever the vacancy level is going down, so as seen in 21-22, uh, that's when we experience the uh, spike in uh, the rental growth. And we expect similar trend to continue in the future as our projection is that the vacancy will come down. We expect logistics assets to witness strong rental growth. Uh, moving on to the next slide, which uh, talks about the investment market. Now, as I said, it's emerging into a uh, investor's, in, uh, investor's favorite asset class and, uh, you know, logistics and industrial assets are now seen as a mainstream asset class compared to uh, uh, asset which is in its nation stage. The chart on the left shows the volume of investment, uh, logistics investments uh, in uh, UK and Europe. And again, as you can see, it was highest during the COVID period around 2021. It's come down because of the increase in interest rates, but again, we expect it to increase. And the yields, this is pretty interesting. 2008, 2009, logistics was not seen. Uh, logistics was seen to be an emerging asset class, and they used to trade at a nine to ten percent yield. For those of you who don't know what a yield is, so for example, if the if a logistics asset generates rent of ten pounds, a ten percent yield means the price of the asset would be hundred pounds. That is just ten divided by ten percent. Now, because it's emerged into a mainstream asset class around 6%. So the, the pricing, the capital value of uh, logistical assets across the globe has grown significantly. And another interesting fact, which kind of proves it emerged into a mainstream asset class is the uh, narrowing spread between the 10-year gilt, uh, gilt and, uh, and you know, the logistic asset, uh, uh, logistic team. So that gives a lot of confidence to investors and more and more investors who are, uh, pro real estate are looking to take exposure to logistics assets. 
now what I will do is I will move to the financial model for which the slides are already uh, attached as a part of this presentation. But uh, excellent. Apologies, the viewers. So uh, I'll start again. So what I was stressing was it's important to set out an assumption space. So as you can see, I call it the assumption page, uh, assumption tab. And every assumption is set out in blue. So it is very important whenever I send this model to someone uh, who wants to look at it, uh, they know that if they or they just need to change anything in blue, anything that's not in blue is derived from something, it's formula driven. So they, they don't need to uh, change those at all. One of the key things while I'm share for uh, why I wanted to share this Excel is to explain you how a rent roll works. So this is a typical logistics uh, rent roll that you'd see. So what are we trying to explain in this rent roll? So we are saying, uh, you know, uh, we have a tenant, old tenant, who's paying about 230 uh, euros a square meter of rent annually, and their lease is expiring in 30th September 2020. And for the purposes of benefit, we have said the acquisition date of this asset is 30th March 2020. So what that basically means is six months after the acquisition, the old tenant will leave, and then we are expecting that a new tenant will come who will take the same area at a higher rent. Now, the, the complexity over here is what we need to model is that a tenant is leaving after six months and then the new tenant is uh, occupying the space. Uh, usually at this point, you know, if I was face to face, I would have asked questions and suggestions in, ter in terms of how people would go about modeling this. Uh, since we can't do this on a webinar, I'll directly jump on to the answer and show that show this to you. So I'll move to the quarterly cash flow page. And what I want to focus your attention on is this section over here from row 24. So I have made quarterly cash flows. And what you'll see is for each tenant, I have to, uh, represented in a separate line item, whether it's for area, rent, or you know the capex, whatever it is. So let's talk about the old tenant and I'll, I'll we'll talk through some formulas over here. What does the formula over here say for old tenant? It says if and. So if and function is used when you use multiple if conditions uh, at one point. So what it's saying is if D24, which is this date, is less than or equal to J5. Let's see on what's J5 on the assumption page. J5 is the lease end date. So basically what I'm saying is if this date is less than the lease end date, uh, then give me... And the second condition is if D24 is greater than H5. What's the assumption H5? H5 is least start date. So what we are saying is if this date, June 20, is less than the lease end date, but higher than the uh, lease start date, then give me assumption F5. Otherwise, give me zero. Assumption F5 is the area of the old tenant. So this is exactly what you see over here, right? So because the lease expired on 30th September 20, I don't see any area appearing over here under the old tenant bucket. And this is the most cleanest way to use the if function. Now I could have used a complex formula and combined what I've done for new tenant over here. So for new tenant, what I'm saying is exactly the same formula where I've said, if the date I've selected E24 is less than equal to the uh, J6. So assumption J6 is the lead end date so of the new tenant. So if it's less than uh, the lead end date of the new tenant and greater than the lease start date of the new tenant, give me assumption F6. And assumption F6 is nothing but the area of the new tenant. This is exactly the formula I have used for showing the rent as well. And what it does is when you... Uh, show everything in separate line item without combining things to make your formula complicated. Uh, when you start actually calculating your uh, revenue numbers, is all you need to do is do a simple sum product. Uh, there are other ways of doing it as well in terms of you know you can use a manual formula, but I I hope the viewers are uh, updated of the with the uh, sum product formula. If not, all this is doing is twelve thousand multiplied by fifty eight whatever is in row 20, uh, D26 multiplied by D31, D27 multiplied by D32, and you divide it by the sum of this area. So, uh, and the reason it's 
important to use a some product formula is because my rent rule is fairly simple with just three tenant lines. In reality, you might have a rent rule with hundreds of lines. So if you can use a sum product formula, it will just help you summarize everything. To be able to use the sum product formula, it is very important to structure your model in a very simple way because we have structured it in a simple way in showing each tenant in a diff with a in a different line and using uh if formulas to capture when a value should be displayed and when not i can just use a sum product formula to create my uh rent the table above which is over here which you'll also see in the presentation is nothing but just the, how i would typically uh show the pnl now obviously this pnl is different from uh student housing or co-working because it excludes certain items such as uh, you know a rent free in student housing assets or in uh, co working you barely offer rent free. Another key modeling tip I'd like to give uh, for logistics asset and uh, guys, what the tips I'm giving over here you can you you can apply the same principles to an office asset as well. It's not just uh, constrained or restricted to logistics asset. Rent free now. It's very common in this industry to offer rent free uh, to tenants. It could be for three to six months. One question I would ask you, and uh, you can probably all think uh, think about it. Why have I shown rent free in a separate line item? And another way could be, I could have just shown zero over here or nothing in the rent free. There's a reason for it. The reason is by modeling it in, it in this way, it helps me to looking at the p &L, I can figure out whether my area is leased or not, whether I'm offering rent free or not. For example, in December and March 21, because there, there is no rent, there's no rent free, I know that the asset is vacant. Now, if I would have not, instead of use the rent free over here, if I if say I would have just done this, my output remains the same. But now I would assume looking at this, that as if my asset wasn't leased in June 21 and September 21, which is incorrect, so showing it in separate line items helps you to analyze what's happening with your business and take insightful decisions. So rent less rent free gives you net rent that you're making for the business. You take out any asset management fee that will get you to the NOI. Once you have calculated the NOI, we take out certain capitalized items. A lot one again, again another question I'd like to ask people is why is brokerage after NOI and not before NOI? You can give it a thing. I'll give you the reason for now. The reason for that is brokerage is a one-time expense. So you will only incur brokerage when you're getting a new tenant. And probably because your tenant is coming for five to ten years, you don't incur it every year. You only take consider those items above NOI which are rec recurring expenses. Anything uh, for which you uh, get the benefit for a number of years are typically below the NOI. So from the NOI, you once you get get rid of brokerage, capex, and income tax, you get to free cash flows, uh, which is used to calculate uh, you know the value of the business. And then obviously I have subtracted the purchase price and then uh, made assumptions around exit price, the capital gains tax, exit cost, which helps me give my unlevered cash flows. For the purpose of this exercise, I will not focus on unlevered to levered cash flows because uh, you know that's more of a corporate finance uh, uh, exercise where I would have explained you how introducing debt in your asset can be beneficial to you to improve your returns. But since that's outside the scope right now, we are trying to understand logistics asset. I'd leave my PNL at unlevered cash flow. Moving back to the presentation. Sorry, I think I shared the wrong screen. Just give me a second. Yes. So uh, moving back to the presentation. So slide seven is exactly what I was showing you in the Excel, the output that I would reflect. I'd like to uh, spend some time on slide nine. And when I say spend some time, the few things I've done over here. First is the output. So in the previous two seminars, I've been talking about sensitivity analysis. In this seminar, I thought because this is the last one of the series and the way you create sensitivity is 
the same using a data table function. I show you how it looks like. What the table two is doing is saying, what my if at different market rents and different cap rates, what my return would be. And this is quite important because uh, you know when uh, when you're negotiating a price with your with the seller of an asset in in this case we are assuming that we are acquiring an asset having this sensitivity table helps you because every organization or buyer understands what their hurdle rate is a hurdle rate is a minimum return they want to make and it just helps them drive an effective negotiation similarly my model is a bit more complex so you can see something called the switch over here I've created a switch over here, which is which helps you calculate returns with financing or without financing. So, if I make my switch zero, without uh, it will remove any financing. If I put it as one, it will get financing, and it just aids with certain scenario analysis. These are again some of the tricks of corporate finance, and I think once you understand the asset and are able to build cash flows until the NOI level, it's quite helpful to know these tricks because it again helps you to understand the impact of different drivers or different variables on uh, on your model or on your acquisition decision and it's quite helpful when you're negotiating with your counterparty uh moving on to the last slide in the interest of time the focus is on best practices a lot of the best practices you'll see are kind of repeated from the last last session uh something that i highlighted in red over here is uh, which I stressed while I was presenting my financial model is modeling each tenant as a separate line item. That is the key, guys. So I I have uh, led a number of analysts uh, who work for me in throughout my career of uh, 10 to 15 years. And what I've realized is people end up building complicated formulas, try to do everything in one cell, and you just increase so many so much chances of error and when I, when I ask them for explanation, people often struggle. Your financial model should be such that, that if some, you have to explain it to someone, you should be able to, you should do, be able to do it using a simple pen and calculator. And that's why it's very important to model each item or each tenant as a, a separate line item, always adopt bottoms up approach whenever you're building budgets. Assumptions have to be presented clearly, highlight them in blue so that whenever you send it to your bosses or if you're, running your own organization, you, you're using it for your own personal consumption, you know uh, what variables to change. Never hard code anything in the model. Model is supposed to be dynamic. If you hard code, it won't help you in driving negotiations because you won't be able to get output immediately. Uh, always build checks to ensure the model is free from errors. And I've already shown you uh, the benefit of having sensitivity analysis on slide nine. So... Uh...